What's going on everyone? Brandon from Gearist here and today we are taking a look at the shoe that I have anticipated quite a bit for various reasons which I will get into later and that is the Catamount number two from Brooks Running. <laughs> Now before we get into talking about this beast right here and comparing it to version one of this shoe, please don't forget to click that subscribe button down below as well as the notification bell to make sure that you get all of the videos that we put up here at Gearist and that you're basically up to date on the latest gear that you wanna get out and get dirty. Also, please don't forget to leave a comment. I wanna hear, have you run in this shoe? What's the trail shoe in the Brooks lineup that you are really going to right now, if any? Please leave those comments down below and now without any further ado, let's get into this shoe right here. Before anything else, let's get into some specs around this shoe. It comes in at 10.6 ounces, which this is about 10.9 ounces, so about 0.3, not quite a half an ounce lighter. And for those of you measuring in grams, that's right at 300 grams. In terms of stack height, which is a difference in height from here to here, we have 24 millimeters in the forefoot and 30 millimeters in the heel for an overall drop of six millimeters. In terms of size, it does run true to size. This is a men's size 11, fits me exactly where I would expect it to be. In terms of pros, we've got a light and responsive cushioning, nice sticky traction and durable construction. There are a couple of cons. One is that it may be a bit narrow for some people that have feet that ride toward the wider side, and it's also not the most breathable thing in the world. This is best for being your everyday trail runner that really does not shy away from a race. You're probably gonna find it being right under 50K at the, at the ceiling for most people. And the price tag tips the scales at $170 US. Every trail runner, or every runner for that matter, has that one shoe that they go to a lot. Now, it may not be the toughest, it may not be the most luggy, it may not be the speediest for that matter, but it's going to be one that shows up a lot in this shoe right here, the Brooks Catamount number one, or the OG version of the Catamount line, is that shoe for me. This is something that I put a ton of miles on because frankly, I would just keep it in the back of my car and if my schedule in a given day were that I knew I was in between things and I really wanted to get in a trail run or something like that, this is the shoe that I would go to. So with that, I was very excited for this right here, the Catamount number two to come out from Brooks earlier this year. So why would a shoe like this, which quite frankly, it's been a long time before putting out a sequel, why would it need a sequel? Well, I, I think for the most part, it's because Brooks took a lot of the really highlights from this, put them in this and cranked it up to the next level. As always, the first part of any shoe that we take a look at is the outsole. Now, in this one, you can see that there is a complete redesign of that outsole rubber. The first thing is the lugs are on neither of these shoes are they particularly deep, right? This is not gonna be your overly luggy, get into soft ground type of thing. Although it does function on that type of terrain if you wanted to. These have gone from having that upper edge, that kind of like leading edge of a chevron to more of just kind of a traditional chevron shape there. Uh, this is gonna shave off a little bit of that rubber that may be where some of the weight loss comes in play. In the rear foot, there's actually a little bit fewer lugs on this side, but they are bigger and much more functional for descending. On version one of the Catamount, these lugs came in at three millimeters deep. On this shoe, they came in at four millimeters deep by a whopping one millimeter deeper. I would also say that the lugs in the forefoot of this look surprisingly like an upside down 47th problem of Euclid, if you know what that is. And on both shoes, they are designed with trail tack rubber. So from a stickiness standpoint, they should perform about the same. Now, the first thing that I will say about this is from a durability perspective, it held up really well. I have run probably four-ish, maybe five miles on road in this, primarily in between like a parking lot and a trail or something like that. Not a whole lot. I will say that because these aren't particularly deep lugs and they're nice and flat, not super textured, this actually can function if you want it to as a bit of a hybrid shoe in that way. Of about the 75 miles that I've put on this so far, the outsole looks to be in really, really great condition, holding up very well, which is not surprising because like even on this shoe, version one, the outsole, I mean, this probably has 500 miles on it and it's in excellent condition for that many miles. Of course, if the durability is good, but the traction sucks, then really who cares? Fortunately, like its predecessor, this shoe does really, really well in the traction space. Number one, that trail tack rubber does a very good job. It's nice and sticky, even on some of the dry, I've talked about this before, dry, more ball bearing-y, kind of dusty, sandy things that we get here in Colorado sometimes. It does really, really well, uh, lending itself to that speedier, more buttery single track that we really love. 
It also doesn't shy away from technical trails. Uh, these lugs are, again, are not super, super deep, but they perform really well, especially catching edges of rocks like I would want them to. Did a very good job from a stickiness standpoint. I certainly found myself with no lack of confidence running in this shoe, regardless of terrain. Now, moving from the outsole to the midsole. The midsole of the shoe is made from Brooks nitrogen infused DNA flash foam with an embedded Sky Vault plate in it. So you can see it says Sky Vault right there. As I mentioned in the specs a moment ago, it does have a drop of 30 millimeters in the heel, 24 millimeters in the forefoot for an overall drop of six millimeters. And it's got a little bit of rocker, as you can see there. Not a ton, but it is there. In addition to the midsole of this shoe, which kind of goes into the upper, you can see there's nothing here. It's just plain midsole foam. This has these kind of wing things. These are actually foam pieces that spill up from the midsole into the upper area. And I'll touch on what those do in a moment. One of the things I liked the best about the first Catamount was the simplicity of the DNA flash foam midsole. It was just kind of there. There wasn't a lot going on in there. There weren't plates and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but it was very simple and elegant within that. In the Catamount number two, that same feel really is present to me. Now, there is that Sky Vault plate right in here, which is meant to be a little more pop, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But overall, that simplicity in the foam still remains. Now, the Sky Vault plate, does it provide more pop? A little bit. I thought that it provided a little more underfoot protection than anything else, maybe a little bit of pop, but overall I think it is an improvement. It's just not going to be something if you're if you're looking for like a carbon plated spring under your foot, that's not what that's going to feel like. So now to talk a little bit about those wing things, these guys right here that are on both the medial and the lateral side of the shoe and they kind of come up like some, about three quarters of an inch, give or take, above the midsole into the upper. And again, I'll touch on this in the upper. What they seem to be doing is providing a little bit of that heel stability. And it does a good job of that. That midsole foam is right about where you would expect to be if you liked the first Catamount version as well. And holds up, no crushing. I didn't see anything there. A good amount of spring, again, which we'll touch on in the ride section here in a second. Moving from that midsole foam into the upper of this shoe, what we see is a dual layered air mesh, which is basically constructed from a single piece. Now the outer layer of that, which is why it's not really one piece, but kind of two pieces. The outer layer of that is abrasion and water resistant, very open mesh. The inner layer is actually a softer, quick dry mesh. Now, I, I, in terms of the, the water resistance of that, uh, I guess maybe if it's light water, but if you go into some water, like it's not gonna bounce. This is not Gore-Tex. The tongue is gusseted internally with that stretchy mesh right there, which we've become kind of ubiquitous on a lot of shoes that we see these days, which holds the midfoot in place. Overlaying the upper and providing that support structure, again, which we see a lot these days is a 3D printed kind of materials, these logo elements, which are part of the external support structure of this shoe. Additionally, there is a pretty beefy toe cap, to be very honest with you. It's a bit of an upgrade in terms of durability in terms of overall toughness and that spills down into a rand which surrounds the entire shoe thus again keeping a little more of that water from going coming in from the bottom as you step down into something that may be like muddy or something like that. The eyelets are using the same materials down here in the toe cap, right? So we can see here, they're all lay flat. So in other words, they're not round eyelets. They are the shape of a shoelace so that the laces stay flat on your foot, thus preventing any kind of fold points which are gonna press down on your foot unnecessarily. At the bottom of the laces, the bottom of the throat right there, we see a gator clip, which you can see right there, which is coupled with back here in the heel, a Velcro, wow, let's get that dust coming out of there, a Velcro gator clip to keep things out of the shoe should you choose to wear a gator with them. While again, in the first version of this shoe, I really do like the simplicity of the upper in it. It's kind of that sleek, very mm, almost minimal, almost minimal. But in this shoe, in Catamount number two, they actually did cater this a little more to some of that, that trail that's not quite as buttery smooth single track, right? So you're gonna have a beefier toe kick if you need it, all of those things. This, this is a very, very durable upper and I have beat the hell out of this shoe. I will say that it seems that in the effort to make this very, very durable, which the other one's durable too. Again, I've got 500 miles on and there's barely a scratch on them. It is not quite as breathable as the first one, not by much. It's not going to make your feet hot, I don't think, unless your foot tends to run pretty hot anyway. Mine don't. I kind of 
kind of middle of the middle of the road there. Um, but it is not quite as breathable as the first one. There is just kind of a medium amount of foam around the collar and around the heel back here. Your foot stays nice and locked in place. And again, these wings which come up on the side, my foot never felt like it was sliding off in any particular direction. And that's pretty evident when we get into the ride section next. Now let's talk about the fit of this shoe. Um, again, true to size, it's a men's size 11. It fit exactly where I would expect it to be. Not super narrow or anything like that, but I found it on my very average foot to fit perfectly. I will say that if you find your foot is wide, particularly in the heel, you may find yourself a bit held in more tightly than you would want to. First, in the toe box, good amount of space. It does come to a bit of a point, as you can see there, if you can look past the dark blue. Um, even on descents, I didn't really have a problem with that at all. My foot felt well held down through the midfoot. In the heel, these wings did a great job, of, especially in off-camber terrain, of keeping my foot nice and solid within the shoe. I will say, again, if you've got a wider heel, these will move a little bit, right? But you're going to feel kind of the heel cup holding your foot maybe more tightly than you would like it. So definitely worth trying them on if you tend toward that 2E zone. And I am curious, if you ran in the first version of this shoe, what did you think about it if you have a wider foot? Did it work for you? Because uh, I'd be curious to see the comparison between version one and version two. Now, having run in plenty of Brooks trail shoes in the past and plenty of Brooks shoes more generally, uh, I will say that my favorite trail fruit shoe from Brooks was the first version of this shoe, the Catamount number one. This guy right here, it's fast, it's light, it likes to go, it's durable, all of those things. I will say that here and there, I found that it did lack a bit of that stability, kind of when you're going off camber, kind of sidestepping rocks, things like that. It's not that it was unstable in that way, but these little wings, it's a subtle move, but they do a good job to really hold the foot in place nicely. On that smooth single track that I keep mentioning, this does just as well, if not a little bit better than its predecessor. That Sky Vault plate, again, providing probably more protection than pop, but it is noticeable, especially when you can kind of open it up a little bit. I'll also say that if you do have the need for kind of a transitional shoe from like a parking lot and run a mile to a trail that's nearby or whatever that is, this actually does quite a good job. It's pretty fun on pavement. Again, I haven't done a ton of it, but I will say that because you can open it up, that pop and really streamline ability of this shoe to kind of go, just like its predecessor, does a good job on pavement if you need it to. Now, am I saying that this is the greatest running shoe in the world? No, I'm not. I'm saying it's very good. Is it the lightest? No. Is its traction good? Yeah, but it's not otherworldly. There's nothing like that. But what it does is it's consistent and it's really kind of just good across the board. Like in like a solid A, A minus in so many categories that it makes it really a go-to shoe. And I, again, will find myself with this living in my car in the back. Now look, I have a bunch of shoes, let's face facts. But this is one of those that's gonna live in the back of my car where I can just pick it up and go even if I don't have another pair of shoes with me. Okay, now here is definitely a con that I have of this shoe, is it's expensive. It's not the most expensive, don't get me wrong. Yes, there's certainly more expensive shoes out there, but it's not world changing. And at $170, that's, that's a little bit pricey. I would be comfortable with this at about 150, uh, but at 170, it seems to be on the expensive side. Now, maybe mile for mile, that's actually quite a good price because it is very, very durable. That trail tech rubber holds up very, very well. You saw the first version of this shoe that I ran in for a boatload of miles and it has a boatload more left in it. Um, but just be aware that it's, it's not cheap. If you're a Brooks devotee, this is gonna be something that you're gonna love. You're gonna be like $170, no big deal fantastic. And I really think that it is the cost per mile that where the value of this is going to be if it's there for you. Now, this is going to be that go anywhere, do anything trail shoe. You can do hikes in it. You can do some scrambling in it. All of those things. It can tackle single track. It can tackle technical trails. It's not going to be world breaking in any of those things, but that real consistency that being, like I said a second ago, an A across the board, that is where this is going to thrive. That's why this is such a great utility shoe for any trail runner out there. Now I'm curious, if it's not this shoe, do you have a shoe that is kind of your go-to, that you can do anything with, that again is not world breaking, but it is something that is super consistent on your foot? What is that shoe? Let us hear it down in the comments below. I would love to hear so that we can have that data for later on. As always guys, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel here at Gearist. Let us know your comments. Go over to Gearist.com, check us out. Follow me on the socials, which is pretty much at Gearist on everything, whether it's YouTube or tw Instagram, not Twitter, because some like 11 year old in Thailand owns that. But 
Follow me wherever you want. I would love to see you there. Thanks so much, guys. Go out there, get dirty, and we'll see you next time.